I'd like to begin this hearing by stating the Oversight Committee uh, mission statement is uh, what we'll be doing in all our different uh, committee meetings. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money in Washington comes from them, uh, that is coming from them to Washington is well spent. And second, that Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to the taxpayers because taxpayers do have the right to know what they get from their government. We'll work tirelessly in partnership with Citizen Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is the mission, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. It's the first committee meeting of the Subcommittee on Technology, Information Policy, Intergovernmental Relations, and Procurement Reform. We have an impressively long title, I know, for everyone on that. This hearing will focus on unfunded mandates and regulatory overreach. Since the founding of our nation, the federal government has had to balance its own authority with that of the states, counties, and cities. While each has a unique responsibility to serve their constituents, they also have to operate within their limitations, both budgetary and statutory. However, lately, we've seen where dedicated and probably very well-intentioned government staff can move from serving people to mandating their preferences and priorities to an agency or legislative body onto people. In the modern regulatory environment, the probability that the federal government will overstep its clearly defined constitutional boundaries to impose its preferences on state and local leaders has become increasingly likely. With apparently little check and balance, federal regulators can dramatically affect the budgets and staff structure of state and local governments. Many state and local governments face severe budgetary shortfalls that threaten their ability to perform basic services. Private businesses are struggling against numerous impediments to job creation. Quite frankly, they're all hurting. The preferences of a regulatory agency should not determine the budget or priorities of a state or local leader. While we are not addressing the issue of private uh, business mandates today, I would also contend there is a significant responsibility of the federal government to restrain its regulatory power to areas that are clearly constitutional in scope and that are not redundant of state or local laws, codes, or enforcements. I hear too many stories to recount where a federal regulation can cost a business millions of dollars with little or no opportunity of recourse or reversal of the matter. When the government enacts a statute or issues a regulation mandating the state or local government or private sector entity perform certain actions but fails to provide the funds needed to perform the action, it has issued an unfunded mandate. The Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995, or UMRA, as you'll probably hear referred to several times today, was originally enacted to minimize the burden of unfunded mandates. This act sought to limit the growth of unfunded mandates by explicitly defining them and by creating a congressional point of order that could be used to help prevent the enactment of legislating creating them. However, multiple agencies and actions were excluded from UMRA, and the definition of an unfunded mandate it established has come under great criticism. This hearing today seeks to determine the effectiveness of UMRA. It, uh, it is intended to focus on Title II of UMRA, which concerns the unfunded mandates handed down by the executive branch in the form of new rules and regulations. While the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act has a, has a great name, it has limited reach because of its inapplicability to many regulatory actions. For instance, most rules issued to implement one of the major pieces of legislation enacted last year, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act and Consumer Protection Act, are exempt from UMRA because it would be promulgated by the Securities and Exchange Commission and independent regulatory agencies. Rules issued by the new Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection created by Dodd-Frank will also be exempt from UMRA. Today's hearing focuses on local governments. I intend to, in a future hearing to bring in tribal and private sector witnesses to testify about their personal experience with burdensome federal mandates. While we're here today from the Mayor of Edmond, Oklahoma, I want to myself relate just a couple of anecdotes from my own state to illustrate why I've called this hearing today. For instance, City of Bethany, Oklahoma, spent over a quarter million dollars in 1987 to put in two water wells, only to be required a few years later to take them out by the EPA because of their wastewater levels. Then EPA changed its wastewater requirements in 2009, costing the city of Bethany over $9 million. The street signs in Bethany also must change to a new type of reflective material to meet the Department of Transportation regulations, costing the city who knows how much yet. The Oklahoma Department of Transportation has to jump through millions of dollars of hoops to tear down an old bridge and to put up a new bridge in the exact same spot. It has to navigate the Clean Water Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and many other federal laws while people drive over an old, deteriorating bridge. What I want to know is whether Unfunded Mandates Reform Act is of any consequence in terms of limiting the issuance of these sorts of unfunded mandates. Many observers, such as the Government Accountability Office, have, have 
commented on the numerous factors that eliminate the effectiveness of UMRA and minimizing unfunded mandates. We'll hear today from GAO about these limitations, exemptions, and, and loop, loopholes. Good news is knowledgeable parties have also identified potential improvements to UMRA, and we'll hear about those ideas today as well. I would like to now recognize my distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from, from Mr. Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for his opening statement. Um, I thank the chairman, and I want to personally welcome him um, to Congress and thank him for his graciousness uh, as he and I have uh, tried to manage the transition uh, on this new subcommittee. And I thank him yeah. so much for his personal uh, graciousness and commitment to cooperation on a bipartisan basis. As a former local government official with 14 years of experience in Fairfax County, I appreciate Chairman Langford's interest in unfunded mandates. Early in my tenure as a supervisor on that board, Congress passed the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, as the Chairman indicated, uh, known as UMRA, following an outcry by state and local elected officials about unfunded mandates and their burden. It was a positive step forward, but as I learned in the subsequent decade, the Act, as the Chairman just indicated, did not fully stem the tide of unfunded mandates. Uh, it was written in a manner that exempted bills from imposed, uh, that imposed significant costs on localities, such as no child left behind. Uh, as has been well documented, the design, testing, and implementation costs of no child left behind increased local educational costs significantly by hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in many, many places, including my own county. I'm pleased that Fairfax County Executive Tony Griffin is here today so that uh, he can discuss the continuing impact of federal unfunded mandates on local governments. I'm concerned, however, that some have conflated mandates with regulation. I recognize that UMRA focuses on both intergovernmental and private sector mandates. However, the focus of our efforts should be on the continued burden that unfunded mandates place on local governments. This was the focus of a series of hearings in 2005 by Congress, and this committee in particular, uh, and I believe it should remain that way today. Despite the technical language of UMRA, I do not consider regulations affecting businesses as unfunded mandates necessarily. As President Obama suggested, regulations should be reviewed for efficacy. But I simply do not believe that mercury, sulfur dioxide, or carbon dioxide restrictions in power plants should be placed in the same box as unfunded federal mandates in local governments. When the private sector is engaged in an activity that places public health or safety at risk, these actions should be regulated. In fact, carte blanche elimination of regulations could create new costs for local taxpayers. In Fairfax County, for example, most smog-forming pollution comes from power plants in the Ohio Valley. Re deregulation of pollution from those plants through repeal of the Clean Air Act or otherwise would increase the costs of local government. The public health impact alone would be significant and would result in more hospital admissions, emergency service expenses, and lost work days due to respiratory illnesses. Fairfax County and other local jurisdictions would be forced to pay for more bus and transit service, telework coordination, and other efforts to reduce vehicular emissions in order to prevent escalating costs of air pollution. It's imperative that our regulatory system prevent companies from passing on those costs of doing business to our local taxpayers. I would be very apprehensive about any effort to use UMRA as a vehicle for an overall review of the regulatory process as it relates to the private sector. I believe that such a review would run counter to the original purpose of UMRA. In light of this, I'm pleased that we have two witnesses today representing local governments. I think Chairman Langford, I thank Chairman Langford for recognizing the importance of this issue to state and local governments. I believe there are some substantive reforms to prevent unfunded mandates that are worthy of bipartisan examination, as the Chairman indicated. For example, the Tax Prevention and Reconciliation Act of 2005 included an unfunded mandate called 3 percent withholding that will impose a cost of more than $70 million on state and local governments, create additional administrative burdens, and reduce competition in contracting. Another Bush-era law, the Real ID Act of 2005, could cost states as much as $11 billion to fully implement an unfunded mandate. In addition, we'll hear about the impact of the BRAC process on local government and local communities from Mr. Griffin. Implementation of BRAC recommendations can impose multi-billion dollar transportation and infrastructure obligations on state and localities if BRAC relocations occur in urban areas such as they do in Fort Belvoir and Quantico in Northern Virginia. Within the context of UMRA, these improvements are considered optional but only if it is optional for my constituents to go to work. 
I support efforts to reform UMRA to take a realistic view of these costs in local governments, but I do not support using UMRA in an attempt to roll back important public health regulations like the Clean Air Act. In addition, I would ask unanimous consent that a letter from the National Association of Counties expressing opposition to unfunded mandates and drastic discretionary spending cuts be placed in the record. I look forward to working with my chairman, Mr. Langford, to examine reforms that would ensure UMRA can be used to measure the impacts of legislation like No Child Left Behind, and I look forward to the testimony today. Thank you. I yield back. Welcome. And I see no issue with receiving by unanimous consent that report. Let me, uh, all other members have uh, seven days to submit their opening statements for the record. Let me recognize our panel and lay some ground rules for the conversation and let you all finally get a chance to be able to talk as well. Uh, Susan Dudley is the uh, director of George Washington University Regulatory Studies Centers. From April 2007 to January 2009, Professor Dudley served as the presidentially appointed administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the U.S. Office of Management and Budget. Thank you for coming. Mayor Patrice Douglas. Mayor Douglas serves as the mayor of Edmond, Oklahoma, a position where she was elected in April of 2009. Aside from her mayoral duties, Mayor Douglas has made a career in community bank as a community banker and as attorney. She's a wife and a mom, and uh, she actually does not have an opponent now for her next re-elect, and so she's able to be here actually fancy free here on that one. Uh, Denise Fantone is the Director of Strategic Issues, U.S. Government Accountability Office, where she oversees work on federal agency budget processes and, and uh, cross-cutting regulatory issues, including federal rulemaking. Very glad that you're here today. And Anthony Griffin, as um, uh, Mr. Connolly has already recognized, Ms., uh, Mr. Griffin's County Executive, Fairfax County, Virginia, appointed in 1999. Mr. Griffin oversees the operations of all Fairfax County government. Thank you for coming up. Uh, you have the shortest drive, I believe, of all of them, but very glad that you're here as well on that. Let me set some quick ground rules for our hearing on it. Each of you has been asked to submit a written statement for the record, and we've also asked you to pre prepare an oral statement uh, no longer than five minutes, so we can allow time for questions and discussion on your statements. You'll see on this desk a series of lights uh, that will count down from five minutes. It'll be green, and then the lights will change to yellow when you have one minute and red when your time has expired, and it'll be just your opportunity to be able to quickly wrap up. After all the panels have given their oral statements, each member present will have a five minutes to be able to ask questions of the panel. Many members may have several questions, so it's very important that you answer the questions quickly and concisely. Don't feel you have to give a lengthy answer on that. Please also forgive the members of this committee if they have to excuse themselves. Most of us have multiple committee assignments this morning and we're juggling concurrent meetings. Your testimony will be recorded completely for review. Though each member completely chooses the content of their five minutes questioning, I would ask the members honor our guest time and attendance by prioritizing answers and information from them instead of making speeches during your questioning time. I would also ask members not to ask a question after their five minutes of time has expired. As chairman, I do reserve the right to remind you that time has expired and ask for a proper decorum during our hearings. Uh, if you have been asked a question, you see the red light come on while you're still answering, please feel free to finish up your answer, though, uh, as a guest here of the panel. All of our panels are bipartisan. There are members of both parties on this committee. It is our desire to hear the facts so we can make an informed decision on in our nation's best interest. There are many issues in Congress that are divisive, but most of the issues we deal with in this committee should be very bipartisan. We're very grateful for the time that you have committed to doing your written and oral statements and the time you've given away from your family for this hearing. May I also say that I understand many or most of you gave up your Valentine evening with your family to travel here to D.C. last night, so please pass on our gratitude to your family and your willingness to share your expertise today. Do understand the ground rules of this hearing. It is the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn in before they testify, so would you please raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear to, that the testimony you're about to give to this committee to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you very much. We will uh, begin initially uh, with uh, Mrs. Dudley, I believe, with your testimony, so if you, we would be very pleased to be able to receive that now. Is this on? Yes, you can just push the button in front of you there and your green light will come on. Thank you, Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the committee for inviting me today. I'm Susan Dudley, Director of the George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center and Research Professor of Public Policy at GW. From April 2007 to January 2009, I oversaw the executive branch regulations of the federal government as Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA. The views I express here are my own. I thought I would use my five minutes to summarize why I think UMRA has been less effective than some had hoped at curbing unfunded mandates and to offer some modest proposals. During my tenure as a wire administrator, executive branch agencies issued 108 economically significant final regulations, 
only 17 of it which were classified as unfunded mandates, and not one of those was considered to impose mandates on state, local, and tribal governments. Now, that doesn't mean that no regulations issued during my tenure impose burdens on other levels of government. Indeed, EPA issued two national ambient air quality standards during that period, and I heard from several states seriously concerned about the costs of implementing them. Um, they were not classified as unfunded mandates because, one, the cost to states did not meet the UMRA definition of mandate, and, two, the Clean Air Act prohibits EPA from considering costs when um, setting the primary NACs. More recent NACs for sulfur dioxide have argued further that UMRA is not triggered because it is the Clean Air Act itself that imposes the obligation on states, um, and EPA is merely interpreting those requirements. Um, another regulation issued during my tenure that a reasonable person might consider burdensome on states was an HHS rule eliminating reimbursement to states under Medicaid for school-based administration expenditures and certain transportation costs. Despite the elimination of approximately $635 million in Federal funding, the rule was not covered by UMRA because it, quote, did not require States to replace that Federal funding with State funding or take any particular steps. These illustrations show the limitations of UMRA. Though both UMRA and Executive Order 12866, which governs agency rulemaking, exclude independent agencies and rely on a threshold of $100 million, UMRA covers a fraction of what the executive order covers, in large part because UMRA applies the $100 million threshold to mandated spending, while the executive order applies it to effects, and UMRA contains seven additional exemptions, more I think that we will hear about from GAO. Not only does the executive order cover more regulations than UMRA, but it provides OMB more authority to hold agencies accountable for conducting analysis and basing regulatory policy on the results of that analysis. UMRA only requires analysis if an agency, quote, in its sole discretion determines that accurate estimates are reasonably feasible and that such effect is relevant and material. In contrast, OIRA determines whether a regulation is subject to Executive Order 12866 and whether agencies' regulations and supporting analysis meet the principles of the order. The executive order calls for quantitative and qualitative analysis and decision factors that are similar to those contained in UMRA. It emphasizes consultation with other levels of government and states that each agency, quote, shall assess the effects of Federal regulations on State, local, and tribal governments and seek to minimize those burdens. As a result, in my experience, the analytical and interagency review requirements of the executive order provided OIRA a more effective mechanism for holding agencies accountable to the objectives, objectives expressed in UMRA, both conducting the analysis to understand the effects of the regulations and in choosing the cost effective, the most cost effective regulatory approach from alternatives. So now on to my modest suggestions to address one, the limited coverage, and two, the lack of accountability. To broaden coverage, Congress could consider aligning UMRA language with that of Executive Order 12866 um, and or extending it to include independent regulatory agencies, which are not currently bound by the Executive Order either. To make the Executive Branch more accountable for the goals of UMRA, Congress could provide OMB oversight authority beyond certifying and reporting on agencies' actions. Congress might also want to expand judicial review under UMRA so that, for example, an agency's failure to justify not selecting the most cost-effective or least burdensome alternative could be grounds for staying or invalidating the rule. Congress might even go further, for example, by making compliance with mandates discretionary for State, local, and tribal governments unless funding is provided. Even without amending the, st the statute, this committee has options for increasing knowledge of the extent of unfunded mandates. Section 103 provides that at the request of Congress, CBO would compare its Title I estimates of the unfunded mandates of a statute with an agency's Title II estimates of the costs of the regulations implementing that statute. I'm not aware whether Congress has ever made such a request, but it could yield interesting comparisons to inform Congress's deliberations of both future legislation involving unfunded mandates and whether agency implementing regulations are consistent with original congressional intent. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Look forward to your questioning. Mayor Douglas, thanks for being here. We, well, we would uh, very much entertain your oral statement now. Thank you very much. 
much, Chairman Lankford, for inviting me. Thank you, members, for allowing me to be here today. I'm Patrice Douglas. I'm the mayor of Edmond, Oklahoma. Edmond is just to the north of Oklahoma City and is Oklahoma's sixth largest city. We have about 86,000 people with a school district of 110,000. We cover 90 square miles. We have a general fund budget of about $43 million, and our overall budget is about $226 million. And last year, Edmund was named the top place to raise a family by Family Circle magazine. I have to put that in there. Um, Edmond, as all Oklahoma cities and cities across the nation, are facing budget decreases. We're a sales tax only city. We're funded only by sales tax and what we make from our utility companies. For the first time in more than two decades last year, we had a decrease from budget of 9%. Um, no living mayor in Edmond had ever faced that issue. We were able to um, prioritize people, and we didn't have any furloughs or layoffs of police or fire. Um, we delayed capital improvement projects, which means roads, bridges, repairs, um, and we were able to cut expenses. Other Oklahoma cities didn't fare as well. They cut expenses and had to lay people off and furlough people, fire police and, and civilian employees. Across the nation, I believe that the picture was worse. And having been at the U.S. Conference of Mayors recently, I heard about mayors who were laying off as many as 30 percent of their workforces. So municipalities are facing severe challenges right now. I first want to commend those of you who were in Congress and supported UMRA when it was passed. I um, hope that you continue to support that, but I hope that we can tighten it up. I hope that we can make it more effective for local governments because we are feeling the pressure right now. Every time we have a federal mandate handed to us, then that is one last thing I can do that my citizens elected me to do. And um, I am held directly accountable because I grocery shop with those people. Um, I want to hit on just a few things that we're seeing as overwhelming costs in our budget. First, the record keeping that we're required to do for stormwater regulation under the EPA um, is extremely burdensome and is extensive. I first want to tell you that Edmund is in compliance, and we are happy about that. Over the last five years, we've done what we needed to do, but it's cost us $2 million to do that. So $2 million that I can't spend to fix roads, all to show that I'm in compliance, that I was not outside the regulatory guidelines of that. Secondly, um, there's people on this panel who know more about the Clean Air Act than me, but I can tell you that Edmond um, sets in the greater Oklahoma City region and that we are in compliance. But there's talk of changing the standards, and if they change the standards, we'll have some very long, extensive processes and regulations and costs that go along with that. I would be remiss if I didn't mention health care. We are right now in the city of Edmond reviewing what our options are with regard to health care. We have traditionally provided, uh, covered the benefits for 100 percent of our employees. At a, we've paid their premiums at 100 percent, and we've paid dependent coverage at 75 percent. Our consultants are telling us that we are going to see an almost 20 percent increase in health care costs this year, which amounts to $600,000. Um, Almost 15 percent of that is direct, directly attributable to some of the mandates that came down through the recent Health Care Reform Act. And that is what we are being told. So we are trying to budget for that. I'm not sure how we're going to do it. We're just now starting our budgeting process. And what I believe is going to happen is we're going to have to consider the options on health care and perhaps lowering the coverage on our employees or raising the premiums or requiring some payback from employees. I'm not sure how it's going to end up, but we're facing that. Um, lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Dodd-Frank Act and the concern that we have with an SEC regulation that's being proposed um, that will affect cities and volunteer boards. I have more than 30 boards and commissions in Edmond with volunteers serving. Uh, if this SEC rule is adopted, it is likely that I'm going to have um, many of my volunteers have to be registered through the SEC. Not only does that um, probably put a wet blanket on volunteers wanting to volunteer for these boards, but it also um, causes my employees where I'm 
um, already short staffed because I'm not filling vacancies causes them additional work. So the cost I can't determine because the rule hasn't been passed yet. But I urge folks to look really closely at that rule because I do believe it's going to impose some serious um, requirements on cities. Thank you. Well, thank you. Ms. Fantone, we'd love to be able to hear your oral statement now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here to discuss the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995 as it relates to federal agency rules. Congress has asked GAO to evaluate UMRA several times and on its 10th anniversary to seek diverse views on UMRA's strengths and weaknesses. Drawing on this work, I will describe exceptions and exclusions to, for identifying federal mandates, summarize GAO's findings, and also present suggestions made by knowledgeable parties about improvements to the Act. UMRA was enacted to address concerns about federal mandates that require other levels of government or the private sector to spend resources without providing funding to cover their costs. UMRA does not prevent federal mandates from going into effect. Instead, the Act's purpose is to provide information on the costs and benefits of federal mandates and rules that meet the reporting threshold, and to obtain meaningful and timely input from state, local, and tribal governments as rules are developed. Before any of this happens, however, rules must pass through multiple steps and meet multiple conditions. My statement lists 14 reasons why an agency would not identify its rules as containing a federal mandate subject to UMRA. Let me give you a few examples. Rules are not identified as having a mandate if costs are imposed as a condition of federal assistance or we are participating in a federal program that's considered voluntary. Other exclusions are based on the type of agency issuing the rule. UMRA does not apply, as has been said, to independent regulatory agencies such as the Securities and Exchange Commission. Or another exemption is where the rule starts. It must begin as a proposed rule. There are other exclusions as well, such as rules that involve enforcement of individual rights, national security or emergency activities, or procedures for safeguarding federal funds. Given these reasons and others I have not described, it is not surprising that GAO found over the years that few rules trigger UMRA. In 2004, we reviewed all final major and economically significant rules published in 2001 and 2002. Only nine tripped the UMRA requirements. Of the 113 that did not, 65 had new requirements that we determined could impose costs or other impacts on non-federal parties. 29 appeared significant and little different from the rules identified as federal mandates. Why didn't these rules trigger UMRA? The most frequent explanations were the financial threshold of 100 million was not met, the rule did not go through the proposed rule stage, participation in the federal program was considered voluntary, or the rule was issued by an independent regulatory agency. Similar GAO findings before and since raise the question whether UMRA adequately captures regulatory actions that might impose financial burdens on others. The evidence suggests the answer is no. In 2005, GAO asked a diverse group from academia, advocacy groups, business, federal agencies, and state and local governments for their views. No one suggested repealing UMRA. They recognized its positive aspects, but found areas that they would like to see fixed. Two areas in particular are relevant for today's hearing. The most frequent comment across all sectors was about UMRA's coverage. Most, but not all, thought that UMRA's narrow coverage was a barrier to the Act's effectiveness. While there was less agreement on approach, many suggested amending particular exclusions, notably as a condition for federal assistance or for participation considered voluntary. Other frequent comments were to lower the cost threshold, which for regulations would be the expenditure threshold, or to include both direct and indirect costs. And some parties, uh, particularly from the public interest advocacy sector, viewed UMRA's coverage as a strength and wanted to include health and environmental protection. As for the underlying purpose of UMRA, it's to generate information about the size and nature of federal mandates. They generally agreed there needed to be more complete estimates 
and a frequent suggestion was that agencies evaluate mandates after they had been implemented as a way to better understand actual costs and benefits. Such information could help provide additional accountability and potentially could lead to better design and funding decisions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Look, look forward to getting a chance to uh, ask you some questions related to some of those. Thank you. Mr. Griffin, thank you for being here. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. I am Anthony H. Griffin, County Executive, Fairfax County, Virginia, a position that I have had the privilege of holding since January 2000. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on the subject of unfunded mandates. It is a subject that is treated with some sensitivity in how Fairfax County legislates and operates. When county staff proposes changes to local ordinances or in how it operates, there is a requirement to identify the regulatory and financial impact of such changes as part of the staff report to the Board of Supervisors. In addition, county staff works in advance with the impacted parties to understand the effects of any changes and to reach a consensus, if possible, on implementation and cost. The county staff frequently is trying to balance the interests of public safety and quality of life with the immediate concerns of neighborhoods and industry. The process concludes with a public hearing. If staff has done its job well, there are few or no speakers and the decision of the Board of Supervisors is usually unanimous. Since local government is the closest to the people, it is ironic that the use of a significant amount of its resources are in fact are dictated by the higher levels of government. In fiscal year 2008, the last time Fairfax County analyzed the cost of mandates, it was estimated that the net cost of federal and state mandates was $751 million out of a $3 billion general fund. Federal mandates accounted for 39 percent of all mandated expenditures for a net cost to the county of $313 million. What is more difficult to do with the cost of mandates is to decipher how much a community would pay to implement a mandate, whether it was a mandate or not. In many instances, Fairfax County chooses to exceed state mandates because the mandate is viewed as a minimum as it relates to quality of life. Schools and mental health are examples. Some federal mandates are not as apparent as, say, the American Disabilities Act or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. For example, Fairfax County is trying to mitigate the impacts of decisions made in the last round of the Base Closure and Realignment Act, also known as BRAC, which in most instances relocated defense employees located near transit to Fort Belvoir, which has no transit and is served by a road system already at capacity. While the county appreciates the additional 26,000 jobs at Fort Belvoir, it actually tried to limit BRAC-related moves in the National Capital Region because of the negative impact to the transportation system. The Defense Department provides no money for road improvements external to military installations unless the impacts exceeds the doubling of traffic. Given that the primary roads involved are Interstate 95 and Route 1, no money is forthcoming. The estimate to mitigate the moves to Fort Belvoir are in excess of $800 million, money which neither the state nor the county have. Unlike the county's process, the federal government did not quantify the impacts of the relocation on the host jurisdiction or the region nor has the federal government in the form of the Defense Department offered to mitigate the impacts. In fact, access to the proving ground of Fort Belvoir would not have been possible without a significant financial contribution by the county and the state. In closing, I would note that regulation by all levels of government are necessary to achieve certain minimums in how services and facilities are available to our public, but communication, sensitivity, balance and identified resources need to be part of the process creating them. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the privilege to speak. I'd be pleased to respond to the committee's questions. 
We look forward to that, actually. And uh, we will go back and forth, uh, getting a chance just to ask questions. And we are just looking for your honest answers and just response to it. Uh, we will take not only your written testimony, but your oral testimony and be all compiled together in the permanent record for it. Let me just bounce a couple questions off of you to be able to get us started. Then I'll have Ranking Member Mr. Connolly be able to uh, ask some questions as well. Mr. Griffin, define for us in your mind and from the county perspective, what is an unfunded mandate? Now, I know if we asked Ms. Fantone, we would get a very strict, clear, defined of what the law says on it. What would your perspective be on what, what How would you define it? My perspective would be um, an obligation imposed on the county which the county otherwise would probably have not undertaken on its own. Okay. That's great. Mayor Douglas, uh, the, the cap is $100 million uh, of effect on that. In the $226 million budget for Edmond, a uh, $100 million burden would be rather large. Is a $25 million burden an unfunded mandate, you would say, would that have an effect uh, if there was a 10% burden uh, on the city of Edmond? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and push your mic there, right there. That's all right. It was on. Absolutely. I need to set up to answer the questions, <laughs> I guess. That's great. Ms. Dudley, tell me a little bit about um, uh, 12866, that wonderful um, executive order that's been out there for since the 90s, trying to deal with the unfunded mandates. You made some specific suggestions for that, uh, including aligning uh, UMRO with the um, uh, 12866, and then you also talked about the independent agencies. Uh, tell me your perspective from a uh, personal perspective on it. Those were excluded. How would the independent agencies be looped into the unfunded mandates? If this were to be reformed, how do you suggest those get engaged? Um, by covering the independent agencies, it, there, there are two parts of it. One, Executive Order 12866 also does not apply to independent agencies. So simply by covering them, um, you wouldn't have the advantage of having OMB serving as a check. So Congress would need to do that if, um, if, if OMB didn't. Um, but I do think there are a lot of important regulations that come out of independent agencies. Right. Do, do you see an issue with those being included in those that are facing the accountability of Congress and of the executive? Uh, would it by nature violate their independent status uh, to have accountability around them, for instance? Um, I'm not a lawyer, yes. although I pretended to be one occasionally. Um, <laughs> But no, from what I understand, it would not. It, it would not violate any constitutional <coughs> principles to include them. Okay, that's terrific. Uh, there was a statement you made as well about the Section 103 about Congress requiring information back. Is my understanding that has also not been required as well on that as a as a follow up uh, to saying, okay, this is what you said it would cost. What did it actually cost? And that, that's an interesting determination that we may have to determine as well on finding other regulations and saying how will we process through that with individuals on it. Um, then you made a statement as well about uh, the judicial review and determining if things are cost effective. Tell us about just the inside conversation that may happen saying, okay, is this the most cost effective way to do this? Uh, is that something that's really discussed often among the agencies? It is. Agencies do take that seriously and OMB takes it seriously, um, but it's, n it's never judicially reviewable. So it's discussed within the executive branch, but there there isn't another branch of government that serves as a check or a balance. Right. In that. So you're saying if there was an agency that determined it doesn't matter, we want to do it this way, there's no way to really stop them That's at right. this point. Okay. Ms. Fenton, let me ask you a quick question as well. Ex uh, give us an, exa an example of a voluntary federal program. You said that was a major piece of an exception that's sitting out there. What, what's, what's a good example of a voluntary federal program? Well, oftentimes uh, what we have is the same kind of thing that actually applies with federal assistance. There's the carrot and the stick. An example um, would be if you have, and I'll use firefighters, uh, oftentimes we provide technical assistance and there may be some cost sharing piece of that. Um, the, as soon as you have a condition in which uh, you want to get a federal assistance, or it can also happen with the private sector. You have to commit to making a decision that you're going to go ahead with a program, and it will cost you something in return for either federal assistance or some other largesse from the federal government. Right. So if there's any option for them to opt out of it, it's considered a voluntary program. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Well, that's terrific. But once they take it on, they have to fulfill all those mandates. Exactly. I think uh, 
Ranking Member Conley, in, in opening statement, described a situation where there is a bit of a catch-22. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to be very pleased to recognize Ranking Member Conley for uh, five minutes of questioning. I thank the Chairman. And again, welcome to our panelists. Uh, Mayor Douglas, uh, one, one thing I did not follow. You referred to voluntary boards and commissions, and of course we have those in Fairfax County as well. Right. Um, I'm not aware of the Dodd-Frank legislation affecting any of our boards or commissions in Fairfax. What were you referring to? There's an SEC proposed rule to carry out some of the language that's in the Dodd-Frank Act that talks about municipal advisors. And they're defining municipal advisors as people who have to be registered through the SEC. The SEC has proposed this rule. Um, I believe lots of cities are coming in and saying, there's a comment period going on right now and are saying please don't do that because yeah. it's going to okay. um, hurt our recruitment of volunteer boards if they have to register through the SEC to comply with the Frank Dodd Act. Presumably that would affect people who would advise the city or municipality uh, in financial matters. Correct. Yeah. But when you look at um, many of my boards, for example, I have an economic development authority that has bonds that go through it it still goes to a bond advisor and the opinion registered by my board still has to be approved by another board advisor or somebody who's well versed in that. Mr. Griffin, uh, do you have a similar situation in Fairfax County? And by the way, I, I think Mayor Douglas, you said your population is 86,000? Yes, sir. And of course, Fairfax's population is what? Um, 1,083,000 as of the census. So you've got a lot of boards and commissions. Have you had this problem from the Dodd-Frank legislation? I'm um, not aware of the details. I suspect that um, organizations like our Economic Development Authority may have to be involved, but I think most of our volunteer uh, committees and commissions would not be impacted. I think it relates only to financial. Yeah. I would invite you that if you've got a similar situation, Mayor Douglas, you might submit it for the record. Uh, Mayor Douglas also testified that she's been advised uh, that the health care reform legislation, even though most of the major provisions don't kick in for another two years or three years, uh, has actually contributed to an increase in her premium cost. Is that the case in Fairfax as well? Uh, yes. Um, Staff estimate is that our cost to provide health insurance for our employees will increase approximately 4% over time to administer the program. Attributed to that? Yes, sir. And what's been the increase in premium costs normally? Um, I would say over the last 10 years, the increase has been about 10% a year. Unrelated to health care reform? Correct. Um, Ms. Pantone. Uh, an unfunded mandate, uh, how does GAO um, separate the issue of unfunded mandates from uh, normal regulation? I mean, the minimum wage requirement, in a sense, is an unfunded mandate. It tells people you've got to pay this much, you can't pay less per hour. Um, no, but presumably nobody would say that uh, we ought to eliminate that or we ought to fully fund that requirement. This is a societal requirement saying this is what a living and just wage ought to be. We may disagree about what that level ought to be. We might even philosophically disagree about whether it's the role of the federal government to impose it. But there's lots of history suggesting, by and large, the United States population agrees there should be such a regulation. How do we separate that kind of regulatory activity, normal, by the state or federal government versus unfunded mandates I would put No Child Left Behind, uh, or the BRAC process, for example, in the latter category. Well, as you point out, this is a decision that is as much a policy and a philosophical decision as anything else. I think probably to respond, I'd like to, to briefly describe what we did in 2004 in looking at, at rules that were not classified as federal mandates. And so we did a variety of different things. First of all, we looked at all of the ones that were unclassified, and that was 113. And then we reviewed the evidence, and the evidence included what statements were available from the agencies themselves that would indicate that there were additional costs. And then we went out and we talked to those that would be affected to see whether we, in fact, had captured correctly 
and that included the federal agencies that were involved as well as those, again, who were affected. And there was consensus that, in fact, there was additional costs, some of which, 29 in particular, that would be significant. So it's, it's kind of the Goldilocks complex here. We're trying to get it just right is a difficult thing. But that's how we went about it in 2004. My time is up, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Dudley. I hope to, in another round, come back to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. The Chair would now like to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania, the Vice Chairman of this committee, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And also, the Board, thank you for being here today. Uh, because I know you're taking time out of your, your private lives to come and do this. My questions are mainly for the mayor because I also sat in the city council in a very small town, a third class bless city. You. Thank you. Bless Thank you. you. Uh, that was after sitting on a school board, so I <laughs> oh, two bless things. You that again. <laughs> <laughs> are I, I am. I am. <laughs> well, you know what? I, and I think that it would be hard to argue that uh, a lot of these are well intentioned when they start off. But I would submit that in our little town, 67 cents out of every dollar we bring in in revenue, tax revenue, is already eaten up by public safety. Yes. And there's so many unfunded mandates that are out there. As a mayor, and as you sit there, and as you watch what's going on, it's almost you're, you're afraid to read your next email or open the next piece of mail that comes through because you don't know where it's going to come from or who's going to ask you to participate in something. So we have these partners that say we need to do this, but they don't bring any money to the table. So if you could tell me. I know what we struggle with in our, in our budgets every year trying to meet all these. Some of the things that you have to do and some of, the, some of the services that have to be cut dramatically just to comply with a mandate, an unfunded mandate. Well, we have to direct money away from our general fund, which is, like you said, that's my 33 percent that I get to run the rest of city government on outside of police and fire. So that's what I run um, my trash collection, I repair my roads, I um, clean my roads after the recent two blizzards, I repair bridges after a 500-year flood that I had this summer. Um, so you're exactly right. What we are looking at this year is simply trying to decide whether or not um, we're one of the fastest growing communities in Oklahoma. So we are an economic engine for our state. We provide jobs. And what we're looking at right now is deciding between keeping people or building the roads to get economic development to our city because you have companies that won't locate there unless you can build the roads. So it's a decision right now for me and my council um, priorities. We have to prioritize, are we going to do the infrastructure projects that we've already delayed because last year we could not build roads, we couldn't do the repairs we needed and that we had budgeted because we had a 9 percent decrease. So um, we're making those decisions. I talk about in my written um, testimony that there's a program called NIMS. Nobody can fight about the fact that Homeland Security is very important. But Edmond was the eighth safest city in America a couple of years ago, yet we're spending at least 82000 and by my estimates that they called me last night, $310,000 to do a training program that we're now having to document we're doing. Um, and we're already one of the safest cities in America. So we're not going to fight against Homeland Security, but it's $310,000 that comes out of my budget in order to get other federal grants. It's money that sits out there and says, if you don't do this, then you don't get these grants. And it doesn't just apply to Homeland Security grants. It applies to other grants. So um, I think local governments are better at determining what they need, mm. what they need, and, and we need to be ready we we need to be secure and safe and my electorate's going to kick me out if we're not yeah, and i understand that like you know also you know the the uh the determination the determination of, of whether a regulation or rules cost effective and what kind of a formula do you do you understand that they use to actually determine if it's if it's cost effective is there a real cost benefit analysis there i mean i i had never seen it I've never and it seen didn't it. it usually doesn't make sense to those of us that actually have to pick up the tab on this so I've, have, nev I've okay. never seen it. Yeah, well, I've I, never seen it. From any of the regulations that are opposed, imposed on the city, I've never seen it. Oh, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Honored to be able to recognize the uh, ranking member of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee of a whole. And uh, glad you're here, Mr. Cummings. I uh, recognize the gentleman from Maryland for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate you on your new position. I'm looking forward to working with you. 
<clears throat> first of all, I want to thank the panel for outstanding testimony. And um, you know, I was as I listened to to us, you know, we have this. You all have stated it. We've got a problem here. On the one hand, we've got the federal government, your representatives, all of us, on the federal level trying to get certain things done. And then when it's filtered down to you all, then you all are where the rubber meets the road. And so then you've got all of these issues that you've got to deal with. And, you know, I just want to ask a few questions with regard to you, Ms. Dudley. Um, you talked about expanding judicial review. And how extensive would that judicial review be? I'm just uh, wondering about that. Um, as, I, as I say, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have specific advice. Mm -hmm. I know that that's a criticism that I've seen of UMRA, mm -hmm. that the judicial review only, the courts could only um, call an agency out for not doing an analysis when it should have done the analysis. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it can't do more than that. Yeah. Well, going to you, uh, Mayor Douglas, certainly we sympathize with everything you've said. I think it's, I think your employees are very fortunate to be getting 100 percent of their insurance covered. I mean, I think that's great. And that says a lot for, for you and your city. Um, but I want to go back to you were talking about spending $2 million on compliance. Sh showing that you comply. Uh, just, just wondering, is that to show that you comply or is that actually putting yourself in compliance or is it a combination of both? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, we were, uh, to my knowledge, we were in compliance, but I am not going to answer that for certain. What I will tell you is that what this money went for was to implement the minimum control measures um, with six areas of focus. Um, to address the stormwater runoff quality and to report on it, to address public participation and to report on that, to address public education and outreach and to report on that, to address post-construction stormwater management and report on that, um, new development, old development stormwater management, and to file the reports. So um, we spent, we, we were in compliance for five years. It's apparently a five-year study. I've been mayor for two, but um, it was a five-year study, and over the course of that five years, it was $2 million. And it sounds like it was for both, and it's for, for being in compliance and then making sure you report on compliance based upon what you just said. And I'm just wondering, um, from each of you members, can you provide us with, uh, with suggestions as to how to improve UMBRA in order to help state and local governments? And I think as I listen to you, Mayor Douglas, um, it sounds like in an effort to plan, sometimes it becomes very difficult uh, if you don't know what's coming down. As a matter of fact, the chairman uh, talked about the case in Oklahoma, your city, I think it was. Is that right? Right. Okay. So what, what does, how does it affect planning and what can the federal government do to um, help uh, locals uh, be able to plan better with regard to uh, so-called unfunded mandates? Well, I believe that I, I think we can't change the mandates um, without getting a, a lot of warning to, to a public, to a municipality. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think you have to give us warning. Like, like you were talking about. Secondly, I think that we need to have input on that. We need to have input. Right now, the SEC is taking comments on what it's going to cost governments and what, how many people are going to have to be registered under this new proposed rule. I'm glad that they're taking comments because they're going to hear from me about what it's going to cost me. Um, I think as well that if you have a city that is showing itself to be a quality city, in all these regards, um, I believe that they should, I don't want to say have less requirements on them, but I think that we should, it should be understood that this city is already in compliance. And um, the bottom line is every decision that requires me to fund a mandate takes money out of my roads, my bridges, my parks, um, my infrastructure in my city. And uh, so I think we just need to keep that in mind, realize that the local officials are the ones who are tasked with um, getting those roads built. 
I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cummings, you had asked a question of all of them to uh, be able to determine what their suggestions. Would you like another couple of minutes to be able to go for the other panelists to be able to answer? With unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman. I would absolutely give that unanimous consent. You bet. Thank you. So, uh, would other members like to be able to help answer that question? Just what, what the suggestions were, I think, was Mr. Cummings' question, what their suggestions were for improving UMRA. Going to the uh, work that we did in 2005, where we brought in representatives from from all sectors that were involved, I'd like to be able to respond to some of their comments on what would help. Uh, notably, and I've mentioned two of them already, uh, and it's been part of our discussion about getting it right in terms of what's the right relationship with federal assistance and how much is involved. Also, the question of voluntary, is this program really voluntary? But the other issue is one of threshold. And for rulemaking, the threshold is, in fact, a higher bar because they use expenditures rather than considering that there are other kinds of costs involved in deciding whether something is, in fact, a federal mandate. So you have to identify it first. And if you take it off the table because you can't meet meet the threshold, then you don't have the written analysis, you don't have that discussion. So if you go with expenditures, and some of the suggestions were to broaden it to conform to other definitions, where you include lost revenue, for example, where you include both direct and indirect costs. Um, in response to your question, I would refer to my testimony, and I indicated that dealing with mandates is really a balancing act. My perception is, is that while it's useful to have a comment period, such as been referred to with the SEC, I, I think it would be helpful if there could be more in-depth, um, uh, if you will, a pilot study of what the impact would actually be in a community or in a state before the legislation is finalized. I think too often the legislation is generalized and impacts are perceived but not actually determined. And I think it would be helpful to have a more in-depth analysis actually at the local and the state level. I'll just say I agree with all of those suggestions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. You're welcome. Please be able to recognize Mr. Labrador from Idaho. Five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm new to this uh, Congress, and I don't have a lot of questions, so I just want to thank you for being here. And it's a little bit dumbfounding that we're, we're hearing testimony that we have agencies that determine whether UMRA applies to them or not, and we have a, a bill that, that is not really being followed. But I'm just going to yield the balance of my time to, to the chairman, and he's going to have more questions for you. But I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Please be able to recognize Mr. Spear for five minutes for questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to all of the witnesses that are here today. Um, Mayor Douglas, you indicated that the city pays the entire cost of health care premium for the employees. Is that the employees correct? currently, the employees. which is a very rich program? I mean, I can't imagine many cities or counties or states or federal government that could provide 100 percent coverage for the premium. Um, but having said that, you indicated that the increase of 20 percent is due, or at least 15 percent, 14.5 percent, is directly attributable to the health care reform law. Correct. Um, and I'd like to know how you came up with that figure. Well, I'm going to have to refer you to the consultants that we hired to come up with that figure. We hire a group that comes in and evaluates our program. We're at the beginning of that. We, in fact, had the first presentation last week in Edmond. What they have told us, their review to us said that it was directly attributable to the fact that we have to begin, since we're a self-funded plan, we have to begin to set money aside for um, the, the requirement of covering up to 25 dependents up to the age of 25 or 26 I can't remember 26 and that we also have to begin to um, make accommodations for the um, the pre-existing condition requirements that they believe are going to lift um, the amount of claims that we have in our plan so they divided it out we asked specifically for it to be divided out so that we would know what was basically the increase that we would have seen versus the increase we are seeing now so you're totally self-funded we are. 
which means that you don't have an insurance company that is providing we have, benefits. We, are, we have a group. We, we actually do have a group. You, you have a level of insurance that you cover, and then you have the excess. You're self-funded for, for catastrophic. For a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. All right. So you were told then that your increases would go up less than 14% um, had health care reform not passed? Yes. Now, how did they come up with that? Again, I'm going to have to refer. Okay. So, I, you know, um, I don't know that that's necessarily all that helpful to us then. Um, let me ask all of you, you know, I've worked in, in local and state government for many years before I came to Congress, so I'm real familiar with unfunded mandates. Um, and they have been the bane of my existence for 20 years because it was always the federal government posing a mandate and um, yet not paying for it. So I don't think it's fair. Um, and I would agree with all of you who complain about that. Having said that, um, for us to be really, I think, productive here, um, I think we should hone in on the most egregious unfunded mandate that you incur, if you can provide the to us. Can any of you? Well, in my testimony, I referred to the BRAC process and the fact that um, 26,000 defense-related employees were transferred to Fort Belvoir from essentially the metropolitan Washington area, the national capital region. Um, and that's imposed a burden on the state and the county um, primarily to make transportation improvements to provide access to Fort Belvoir uh, because the road system serving Fort Belvoir was already at capacity. And so mm. we're having to make significant new investments uh, to facilitate getting people in and out of the fort while also maintaining traffic flow past the installation. The primary routes uh, for Fort Belvoir are Interstate 95 and Route 1. Um, and and uh, we uh, have no uh, money forthcoming from the Defense Department to mitigate those impacts. Um, and that's not something we were really consulted about. Uh, uh, it's just, it happened. Now, the good news for Fairfax County is that it uh, certainly strengthens the county's uh, employment base in that part of the county, and, and we do appreciate that. Um, but it's offset by a significant uh, taxpayer investment by um, the locals, in essence, to accommodate that. Um, and that, that's a, probably the most egregious recent example that I could give. But there was a cost-benefit associated there. It's not like a mandate that's imposed without any benefit. Well, it, it's debatable whether uh, there's a benefit or not, because as I indicated, the employees were already in the region. Um, and in fact, they were vacating uh, leased office space, which was a benefit to the private sector, and going into space built on federal facilities. And so uh, the county uh, no longer accesses uh, the property tax, if you will, that we benefited from before. So uh, we haven't done a precise cost-benefit, um, but in the, in the long term, I think there's a benefit, but in the short term, uh, there's a significant cost. Anyone else? Yes. Ms. Dudley? Well, I'd, I don't represent a state or local government, so I'm not sure I'd be appropriate. But I thought that the examples in both of our local representatives' testimony provided illustrations of, of what they thought were the most egregious examples. All right. I don't know if my, has my time expired. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Connelly and I are going to do one more uh, set of questions between the two of us, and then we're very, very grateful for the time that you all have. Let me just follow up on a couple of things. Mayor Douglas, if you'd like to submit uh, the statement from the consultant just as background on that, you're welcome to do that, and I'd be glad to be able to pass it on to Mr. Spear and uh, so be able to get the information on that. The question that you had raised on this, Mayor, uh, was you need more warning, more advanced information. Yeah. What, what, what is an appropriate amount of time to say if this mandate's coming? three months, six months, two years, five years, what, just a ballpark on it. Well, it. We budget out five years. Not all cities do that, but we try to look at a five-year plan. Um, I'm not saying that we need five years, but we need adequate time um, to, to get that 
rolled into our budget. When these rules come down and you find out that you're going to have to spend, you know, $400,000 out of your general fund in the next year, that's a near impossibility for a city the size of mine to do. So I would say um, take into consideration the fact that we have a one-year budget cycle and so rules need to accommodate that. Um, I also believe that it's really important to note that what some of the panelists have talked about is direct and indirect costs. And you can't always determine the indirect costs quickly. It takes you a little while to get a handle on what some of those indirect costs are. For example, that NIMS training, it took us a while to get a handle on how much it was going to cost us to comply with the Homeland Security requirements. So um, we thought at first it was going to be a small amount of money, and now it's come out to be in two years $310,000 which is not small to my general fund. So um, I, I would urge caution in rules like that. Mm -hmm. I would urge that you understand that it's local governments that are going to be funding things like that. And you look at um, whether or not you're actually getting a benefit out of them and for the cost that it's costing to those of us who are the rubber meeting the road. Have, have to I like bear the burden phrase. of it. Yeah, have to bear the burden. Ms. Dudley, let me ask you this. There is some concern to say that the input, and, and Mayor Douglas mentioned as well, they, they just want input on it, that a, an agency could create a rule, seek public comment. Do they have to abide by that public comment? If there were 500 comments all saying this is a bad idea, do they have to respond and say, no, we, we can do it? Is, is it typical for them to be responsive on that? What, what have you experienced? There are several requirements on agencies to respond to public comment, um, probably the most important of which is the Administrative Procedure Act, which does involve judicial review. And if an agency ignored all their comments, um, the courts would be able to find that it was arbitrary and capricious and could send it back, send okay. the rule back to the agency. How, how do we get then public comment from municipalities? Uh, to say this is a, a possible unfunded mandate that's coming down. How do we allow municipalities to do that in a reasonable way? Well, agencies try to notify like potentially affected parties as early in the process as possible. Um, and they're required to not only under the under UMRA, but also under the federalism executive order. Um, and in fact, I'm on the administrative conference of the United States. and. We just came out with new recommendations on federal preemption and how agencies should spend more time consulting with state, local, and tribal interests before issuing regulations that will have those impacts. Okay. Mayor, are, are you experiencing that? And I could ask the same thing of Mr. Griffin. Do you feel like you are getting, you know, that is the rule. Do you feel like you are getting information to say this is coming, preparatory information? Well, we've been, we were notified, we read articles about the SEC proposal to comply with the Dodd-Frank Act. So we read about that. My city treasurer came to me and said, okay, I think this impacts more than just um, the city treasurer's office. And then there was an article, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal talking about how it's going to affect volunteer boards. And uh, there were comments from several statewide Treasures. But that's, that's not actually coming from an official that's not federal source on that. So. From an official federal Mr. Source. Mr. Griffin, have you experienced where the federal government's contacting you and trying to get input and say this is a consideration that's going on? Generally not. Uh, most of my information comes from my staff who either read the Federal Register or through professional uh, associations okay. that uh, have notice. <laughs> or your Congress, that's true. <laughs> and let me ask one more quick statement. Ms. Dudley, um, a, a couple of comments have been made about EPA, and I know your comments earlier on that from my wonderful ranking member on it, uh, about uh, the air quality standards and such. Would that fall under an unfunded mandate as it currently stands now? No. Okay, so that, that is outside of what is, uh, though a city may have to spend or a municipality may have to spend millions of dollars in readjusting that, that would not be considered an unfunded mandate that's according right. to the law at that's this point. That's right, for several reasons. Okay. Great. Those are all the questions that I have. I'd be glad to be able to yield some time to my ranking member, Mr. Connolly. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And before Mr. Cummings leaves, I do want you all to know that Mr. Cummings and I practice what we preach. We, uh, with his leadership, we introduced a bill on the, uh, to regulate, further regulate, frankly, uh, water quality for the Chesapeake Bay in the last Congress. And we created a new standard for local governments in the watershed for, uh, to have low uh, development impacts, to have one standard that applied to everyone. 
but we funded it. We provided a substantial mm -hmm. amount of money for local governments to apply for grants to fully comply with the new standard. Uh, and ours was the only bill that did that, but because we were sensitive to this very issue, I just thought for the record, Mr. Chairman, we'd point out we practice what we preach. Uh, and I thank my colleague Elijah Cummings for his leadership. Um, Ms. Dudley, uh, you in your testimony talked about, and I certainly am intrigued and would welcome working with my chairman um, uh, and others on the committee on tightening up UMRA. I'm, I'm all in favor of it. As somebody with big local background, uh, local government background, drove me crazy, and I'll start with no child left behind. Good intentions, unfunded, uh, too rigid. Uh, and I fought with the previous administration and their Secretary of Education very publicly about this issue, so I can't wait to address it in this Congress. However, uh, you talked about maybe creating a new judicial standard that would make it easier to seek an injunction to stay uh, the implementation of a new regulation. Do you want to just expand on that? Because, and then I want to follow up, if I may, Mr. Chairman, with Ms. Fantone as a follow-up to your answer, Ms. Dudley. Um, uh, the reason I suggested that, as I was trying to find ways, I, identifying why it has not been more effective, and one of the reasons it hasn't is, even when analysis is required, um, that's all that the Act does is require the analysis. And as we've discussed, it's a small subset of the rules that we might, a normal person might think is an unfunded mandate that actually gets covered. Um, the analysis, um, the, the analysis as Umber states, it isn't, it isn't to say let's not do this regulation. So it's not deregulatory, it's really a transparent accounting of the information that we know about the costs and the benefits. As Mr. Griffin says, let's do a balancing. So it requires among the alternatives you look at, look at the costs, look at the benefits, qualitative as well as quantitative, and find that, um, find the least costly, least burdensome or more, most cost effective alternative. Um, there is nothing in the statute that provides any checks and balances on that, either from OMB or, um, or from the courts. So that would be a, a suggestion. Perhaps modest was, was not right. Perhaps that's not a modest suggestion, but would be to allow the courts to say, well, the analysis didn't demonstrate that you've chosen the least costly right. approach you could. L let me just ask, um, though, um, in, in the category of perhaps unintended consequences, because everything you just said sounds awfully reasonable to me. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? But in looking at the language of the statute on the books, it expressly provides that an agency's failure to perform any estimate, analysis, statement, or description cannot be used, cannot be used as a basis for delaying or invalidating a rule. So what we just talked about would actually significantly alter the current statutory language in UMRA. And Ms. Fantone, it's in, in a report issued two years ago, GAO said that uh, in terms of the average rulemaking, new rule, it takes four years. If we were to change the judicial review language in UMRA, what might that four-year review process now look like? You asked me the question that I, it's difficult for me to answer first because, again, I'm not a lawyer either, and judicial review is not an area that I feel qualified to talk about. The process, I th the report you're referring to is a federal rulemaking report in which we try to identify how long something takes, what are the resources, and frankly, we got a very mixed response. A lot of it has to do with the complexity of the rules themselves. And to, to come up with sort of a, this is the proper amount of time is not going to be something that I think is a fruitful, fruitful direction. I would like to add to some of the comments that have already been made in terms of suggestions of what Congress could revisit, and I think address some of the questions here, which is right now there's an exclusion for uh, those that don't go through proposed rule making. And so that would be an area to, to revisit whether there's opportunities there to get some of the information that would help balance the equation a bit. and then. Adding to that would be retrospective analysis, which potentially could improve cost-benefit analysis by looking back and seeing, well, how well did agencies do in estimating these? So I'm sorry I didn't answer your question directly, but I think these are other things that might my assist. I thank you, and my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you to all of our witnesses for taking time to be able to be here.
uh, I want you to know all of this is recorded and written down and is reviewed. In fact, in preparing for this particular hearing, I was going back through the notes from the 2005 and previous hearings where we've been dealing with these issues before. In fact, uh, ranking member Mr. Connolly was actually on the other side of this table in 2005. I was going through the notes on that as a witness there. Uh, so th these are very important comments. They are held in record, and there will be decisions that will be made in future days based on much of the input that you've given there. I thank you very much for being here. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. Okay, thank you. Good job. Thank you. No.